Hi, this is Ian Desher, author of William Shakespeare's Star Wars, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi. With Dan Z, this is the podcast you're looking for. As you know, M-Count cannot be directly replicated from the source. However, Nala say you of another way. To what do I owe this, uh, summons? Questions have been raised regarding the financial impact your facility is having upon Imperial resources. And now, additional funds have been diverted at your request? That is correct. It is for a project that is of personal interest to the Emperor. I don't even think there's room on this ship for all this gear. Oh, yeah? Well, maybe I should leave you behind. There's no hiding cross here. The Empire knows I'm here. They won't stop searching until they find me. Our only choice is to let them capture me. What? This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Coffee with Kenobi. We are going to talk about a quite dynamic two-part episode. I shouldn't say it's not really a two-part episode, but they do go together quite well. I'm talking about Season 3, Episode 10, Identity Crisis, and Season 3, Episode 11, Point of No Return. So with me, as always, are two guests, two returning guests. One you will recognize right away, Mr. Mason Zare. Mason, welcome back, my friend. Thank you. It's great to be back again. It sounds funny to call my son my friend, but you are my buddy. That's for Mm -hmm. sure. And I love talking about these with you. We are going to... Enjoy going through both of these. We're also going to bring back another really good friend of the show. We had the good fortune to spend some time with him uh, recently um, at a pretty spectacular church in, in the Washington, D.C. area. Mr. Father, uh, Jimmy Morgan. Father Jimmy, welcome back to the show. Mr. Father, is that a thing? Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me back. It's a great honor, and it was a great joy to see the three of you on your Easter break. Mason, it was good to meet you in person. And I'm excited to talk a little Bad Batch with the both of you. Yes. Well, these these episodes, I, I feel like I should apologize to the both of you. These episodes are um, pretty heavy. They they are quite heavy, and we will get into that. Mason, I, I'm really curious about this. As always, we don't really talk beforehand about what we're going to say on the show, but give me one word for the first one. We'll just, and we're just going to break them out. We're going to talk fully about identity crisis. Then the second half of the show, we'll talk about point of no return. But Mason, give me one word for identity crisis and overall thoughts on the episode. Okay, so my one word for identity crisis is caring. Because Dr. Carr, because Nala Say isn't in the job anymore with the, I forget what they call them, but the young kids who have basically the force, a lot mm-hmm. high F count. Right. And she takes that job and starts caring for them. Okay, very good. I think I, they call it, they, they call them subjects. Is that right? It's yeah. something with an S, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think that's or right. Maybe they're called specimen. Specimen. Yeah, specimen. Specimen, yes. They are definitely called specimen, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, thank you, Mason. And I'm glad you found something optimistic in this episode. Father, Jimmy, what about you? One word and overall thoughts. Well, my word has a hyphen, uh, and it kind of complements what, what Mason said. It's almost, in a sense, the opposite. Uh, I, I I said cold blooded, mm. and it was because the the cold blooded nature of the empire really showed forth in this episode how they don't really see people as people or you know kind of intelligent beings as having dignity and I think that's where Doctor Carr's caring side came out so much it was it it really shone forth in spite of the cold blooded nature of the empire. That is that is also a good word and another accurate word. So we're two for two. Let's see if I can round it out and hit everybody home. I'm going to say horrific. I was really disturbed by this one. And in fact, I almost felt I kept peeking at you, Mason, um, uh, to see how you were reacting to it. Because I was very, very disturbed uh, by the treatment of these kids that are much more than a specimen. They're 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 people with with, you know, they're not they're. They're sentient beings. They're, they're maybe alien species, but they still are are kids. 
especially the youngest one being taken away from her mother or his mother. I'm not sure what gender the, the little creature is. I'm not even sure what species that creature is. Because uh, we always record these a day the episodes come out, so we do not have the uh, the blessing of the StarWars.com episode guide just yet. I'm sure by the time you listen to this, they will be out there and be public. But it, it was a hard one to get through. Uh, very, very bleak, but very, very important, I think, to the overall story. So rather than go linear through this, I mean, basically what happens is we meet three new children. Uh, they have very high M counts as well. They are inside um, this small structure uh, that, that is um, that Hemlock has kept all of these specimens uh, trapped inside, and they are basically forced to play games. Um, and we are told by Dr. Hemlock right away that there are a few adults left that have this particular M count in their bloodstream, and we know why that is because of order 66. So uh, overall sort of opinions on this and what things jumped out at you. Uh, Mesa, why don't you go first? Probably just um, how much they paid attention to mostly Eva and a little bit of Jax, but the other one, they made like those little looks that she gave them. Mm -hmm. Like they kept it like a secret. Like we're going to see her in a future episode with something important interesting i i gotta say i know i'm biased because i'm your dad but the fact that you remember these names blows me away i wrote them down and i don't remember these <laughs> names and i've watched them multiple times so yes i i agree with you uh father jimmy what what stands to, out to you about this entire little sequence at the beginning mm -hmm. i think it what stood out to me was how bleak and sterile this kind of confinement area is it was all very black and white and gray. And, and even though Dan, you said they're, they're playing games, the games don't look like very much fun or at least they're not having fun playing them. And it just was bleak. And one thing that really popped out to me was that the only real color that, that seemed to be in that area was the skin tone of the three mm -hmm. uh, young younglings for lack of a better word. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. That's a, I mean to cut you up, but yeah, I think that's a good catch. And I hadn't even thought about that because everything is very gray and, mm -hmm. and, and sterile and and emotionless. And to no to no one's surprise, who's ever seen anything with the Empire or the First Order, they don't use names; mm -hmm. they are numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, Hemlock says to Emery that children are easier to attain and more agreeable to the subjugation. So subjugation, in and of itself, is is a very negative connotation. When it comes to human beings, he also says they're unaware of why they're here and what they possess. We see their blood being drawn. They're continuing to experiment on them because the M count cannot be directly replicated from an actual source. So these experiments continue. We also find out what has happened to Nala Say. Uh, Mason, what happened to Nala Say and, and what, are the, what are they doing with her? She just went when they went to that cell. They basically, like, her job, like she gave to Dr. Carr, mm -hmm. um, she doesn't have that job anymore. Dr. Carr takes over that job, and they're basically replacing her. Yeah, Nala Say is a prisoner, and I noticed, Father Jimmy, that Nala Say is even more slow in her speech, even more deliberate and extraordinarily downtrodden, like like all of her joy and her will has is, is been tapped out. And the fact that they're still keeping her like that uh, it was pretty hard to watch. Yeah, I agree. That was a, a it was hard to watch because the scene was so well done, mm -hmm. so well written and so well acted. I the on one of my second watch throughs, I yes, the, it, I did get the sense Nala say was downtrodden and kind of broken, but then kind of at the end as she's asking these questions to Dr. Carr that's kind of pushing Dr. Carr's Kind of limits kind of pushing dr carr into this new mm -hmm. sense I, I almost got the feeling that nala say was being very um specific in her questions like she knew she had to ask specific questions to get dr carr to think in a particular way mm -hmm. i agree with that i mean it's 
So you found a sense of she's got an angle. Is that what you mean? Or do you or just sort of she wants to figure out the information so she can have some peace of mind? I, I got more of the sense that she had an angle. Um, and this angle was that she used to be um, the one caring for these children, protecting these children. And now she's trying to convince Dr. Carr to take over that role. But the empire is most likely listening to this conversation. So she can't say it directly. Right. True. Very true. Well, uh, these three kids, uh, Mason, you remember the, the, the young boy who has the green skin? Jax. That's Jax. Okay. Well, Jax, at first Jax appeared to be some sort of an instigator or a rebel. I almost thought he was going to be sort of, um, contemptible and in sort of argumentative towards the other kids, but really he wasn't, he really like any kid in that situation or any adult for that matter, he just wants to go home, tries to escape. Uh, Emery promises that uh, he's going to be okay, but he's not. He, they, they put, they hold him captive. We don't know where for a certain amount of days. I think they said two rotations. Is that right? Mm -hmm. We're just assuming that means 24 hour two 24 hour periods. And, it's uh, everything goes dark. Everything turns red. Emery is very interesting to me. We know that Emery is like Omega. She's like, she, she's referred to as a sister, like a, a clone of Omega. Actually, what is going on with Emery? Now we don't have a lot of information here and naturally we're not going to speculate. Um, but what, what do you think is going on? Why is she still going along with all of this? I honestly think she's trying to hide something. You do? Like what? Like, um, ever thought that maybe they haven't taken her M count blood test? Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I noticed that too. I, I, I wonder, I would be shocked if they didn't. Oh, do they even know that she's a clone? I wonder, has that ever been addressed in this? Do you, either of you can remember? I don't think it was addressed um, from an outside source. Obviously, she mentions it at the end of last season, but but only with we... Omega, right? Hmm. I had I had never thought that she might have a high M count. <laughs> that hadn't crossed my mind. So that's a great great observation. Yeah. I, now that I think about it, and of course, people listening probably have a have a really good sense of this as well. I don't know that it's public in the Imperial sectors. I think only Omega knows, which means that the members of the bad batch know too. Mm -hmm. There, there are two, I, I, I guess I could say fun surprise guests. I don't know how fun they are for the people who they're uh, sharing screen time with, but we get two guests on this. Episode. First we get Cad Bane and then we also get uh, Tarkin. Wilhelm Tarkin or Will of Tarkin. Um, let's, what, what do we want to say about these two? I mean, Cad Bane, I think very, very clearly he's Cad Bane through and through. He's, he's arrogant. He's mysterious. He's very cold blooded. This is obviously way before the book of Boba Fett in episode eight or chapter eight, I should say, where he is defeated and gunned down by Boba Fett. But this is very much when he's in his prime, I would say. And his lack of compassion towards this child or this, this mother is heartbreaking. I've always said that Cad Bane is my favorite bounty hunter, but this episode really left a bad taste in my mouth. And I mean, that's, that's good, obviously, but story-wise it's very effective because we know as an audience, if Cad Bane is there, we've already seen him outdraw Hunter in, in season one. We know that he's not going to be bested. Yeah. I think Cad Bane's, appearance really helped um show just how callous they are how callous he is mm -hmm. even when he's leaving after he's kind of kidnapped that child and just the way he throws the money at the person who gave the tip it's just yeah i i agree i, I was just like man cold blooded and is there ever going to be an aqualish that is nice every time they show an aqualish <laughs> They're all, I just think it's interesting. There are certain alien species, and I've brought this up before. They always are the same sort of style. It's almost like everybody on that planet or in that culture is nefarious, which makes it 
you wonder how they even were able to navigate the universe, really. Uh, and then, Ma Graham, Mason, anything you want to say about Cad Bane? No, I think he was very cool, though. Why? Just, you can tell by the way he walks, he thinks he's the best person in town. <laughs> that is true. That is true, and he's got a terrific, he's just got a terrific, a terrific voice. Uh, and then Tarkin shows up, uh, and Father Jimmy, why don't you take the lead on this one? What jumped out about Tarkin for you? Uh, that scene with Tarkin and Hemlock, the thing that really stood out to me about it was it, it kind of revealed that I it makes me suspicious of Hemlock's ulterior motives. The fact that he's working on this project that seems to have a personal connection to him. And if it was so specific that it's just this top secret project of the Emperor that Tarkin would have known that and, and kind of backed off. But it seems like Hemlock has some type of an ulterior motive in, in here that hasn't quite been revealed. And I think it gives him, it could give him a extra motivation. He's already played a very good, just creepy, sleazy, mm -hmm. imperial bad guy. But now maybe he's getting an extra layer to why he's, such a dislikable person <laughs> and him hemlock one of the most famous poisons for right. <laughs> uh, for uh killing one of the great thinkers uh in human history so interesting that he has used uh as sort of a deconstruction i mean he clearly is pro knowledge but he's certainly not pro humanity by any stretch of the imagination mason what about uh tarkin for you yeah he was like it was interesting how hemlock wouldn't tell him what the name was and how he like does it with the emperor and my guess it has something to do with vader he is there too with some kind um but he won't tell tarkin i think that's very interesting i do too and this is of course the great stephen stanton uh who is the voice of tarkin good to see him back as tarkin what i what stood out to me about this is that anytime tarkin shows up he is the top dog even in a new hope the first time we ever got to experience Star Wars, he's in charge of Vader, or it seems to be, if not in charge of Vader, Vader is not really a part of his plans because Tarkin pulls the strings. In this, it's the first time we've ever seen someone Imperial deny Tarkin. And he says, that's classified. And everything we've seen, even in Rogue One, Tarkin, there's nothing that is above Tarkin's reach, nothing that is, is past Tarkin's scope of knowledge or sphere of influence so the fact that he can pull it it's classified tarkin clearly does not like that and we have never seen that before no shock that there are in, there's imperial infighting and um one-upsmanship we certainly saw that a lot in andor in the comics and other different iterations of the empire but that stood out to me is really really interesting uh, the only other thing really at the end of this episode is that emory takes that tuka that straw tuka doll and gives it to one of the children uh which one was it which child was that again eva eva yes thank you i i don't even need a piece of paper when i've got mason and eva seems you know comforted by this entire thing and that's how it ends that's how it ends it's it, i felt like even though this episode was like 20 what 24 minutes long it felt like three hours because I just, I felt so oppressed uh, by it, almost like I was one of those kids uh, in in that detention area. Very, very heavy stuff, but very, very effective storytelling. And I, I, I think we could probably wrap this up, unless there's anything you want to say, either of you, about this episode. Nope. Two, two quick things, and one is not uh, an original thought of mine. My friend Dan brought this up that. I think this might be the first episode of the Bad Batch that doesn't have a member of the Bad Batch in it, um, which mm. which is which I think is interesting. I didn't I didn't scour all the other ones. Yeah, that's but, okay. I uh, think season I think mm. the first episode of season three was the same. It just had well, it had Omega. Did she, are you counting her? If we're counting uh -huh. her, then yes, you're, then Dan is correct. Yeah. I always trust in Dan's when it comes to Star Wars. <laughs> They're pretty good <laughs> at that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> The, the other thought uh, with the episode is how it ended as well. And, and it ended a little differently. I think both these episodes did where usually there's that ending shot 
and then a little pause. And then when the credits come, there's the credit score. Mm -hmm. But in these two episodes, there's different music that played over the credits. Right. Um, and that was really good for today because it made me click right to the next episode. It kind of really led right into the next episode very well. Very, very true. Uh, and you're right. There is a very dramatic pause there, almost like you're waiting for something to happen or some sort of ominous, creepy appearance. But there was nothing like that. So so let's give this one um, our letter grade before we move on to the next one. Mason, what is your uh, letter grade and in, in final thoughts? I'd say my letter grade is an A- minus because this episode had so much to do with the story showing us finally and Dr. Carr mm -hmm. that place where they keep the quote-unquote specimens. And you get to see what they're showing. And I don't think anybody thought that's what they were putting in there so i no. think that was very important to the story i totally agree i think we were expecting some sort of a super soldier or some sort of creepy thing and, and no it, what was your grade again i remind me again a minus a minus okay very good father jimmy what about you for identity crisis i i actually gave this one an a plus oh. i normally hold back on those till the end of the season just because i think each episode is part of a greater whole but this one, I thought the, the voice acting, the animation, the score were all top of the line. And they did a lot of revealing important plot points. Very, very good. I think I will give this one an A minus two. Uh, I think the construction wise and, and tonally, how it made, how it set up things and, and the atmosphere that it creates for the viewer. I think that's an A plus. I'm only giving it an A minus because... This is not one I will revisit because it just depressed the heck out of me. Mm -hmm. And so that means it's great storytelling and it did its job. It very much did its job. So let's let's move on then to point of no return. This one is much more of a traditional episode of the Bad Batch. We get to see more of, of the mysterious clone trooper, clone trooper X. We get to see uh, Fee Genoa at the very, very beginning. Uh, and her ship is... Um, snuck into, why can I not think of a better word than that? Infiltrated. There we go. Mm -hmm. Infiltrated by uh, Clone Trooper X. He's very much on a mission here. Uh, let's give one word and overall thoughts on this episode. Uh, Father Jimmy, why don't we start with you this time for Point of No Return? Okay. I, I wanted to use the same word for both episodes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but for slightly different reasons. So for this one, though, I'm going to say heartbreaking. Um, just sort of with this sort of siege of Pabu, which is sort of this very joyful part, I guess, of the home of the Bad Batch, as they even say it. And then even and then the way the episode ends as well. Yes, I agree. Uh, hmm, no hyphenated word this time. Not this time. I'm a fan of the hyphenated word. I <laughs> very much am. Mason, what about you? I have a hyphenated word for this one. Oh, okay. Um, mine is not suspected. Oh. Because the Bad Batch did not suspect anyone to come to Pabu and come, like, attack them. But Asajj Ventress did. So, and the Bad Batch didn't listen to her. That's true. Oh, very true. Very good. Very wise. Both of you wise, uh, naturally. My, my word is devastating. I, I was going to say heartbreaking or horrific, uh, but this is devastating. Of of my, what, 40 plus years of watching and reading and talking about and writing and babbling about Star Wars and driving my wife crazy talking about lightsaber colors, I have never disliked, near I say hated the Empire until this episode. I really felt the full weight of the horrific nature. Now, Andor, of course, does it much more overtly, almost like in a Martin, Martin Scorsese kind of a way. It, at times, much more in your face. This one, I was more emotionally attached. For whatever reason, the people of Pabu, they're not real people. I mean, none of them are real people. This is a fictional universe. It's a story. It's pretend. But these are, at its core, this is a peaceful place. And they, they, Jennifer Corbett and Brad Rouse said on this show and in other shows, 
they created Pabu during COVID because that was the place they wanted to go to. That's the, vo- va- the vacation. That's the oasis. That's the place of serenity and peace where people work together in harmony. It's almost par- like a paradise. And to see these cold-blooded, you know, faceless soldiers go in there and burn things down and throw people on the ground and arrest them and scare them made me so angry. And I thought it was so unfair. I kept hoping like Asajj Ventress or Ahsoka or somebody would show up and save the day. It's not going to happen. But I looked at Mason when all these things were happening in Pabu and I said, you know, when this must be a really good ending to this season because things are really, really getting dark here. And of course it ends in a, in a horribly dark uh, way. But before we get to that, we have ice cream, right? Is this the first time we've heard Star Wars use the word ice cream? Or something like that, because isn't it? What is I it? Wrecker is racing to go see, get you some ice cream. Is that right? Yeah, I no, he says, says ice cone, ice cone, ice cone, yeah. and it very much looks like a snow cone. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, yeah, it it sets up things really kind of beautifully. Everyone is working together. Um, Father Jimmy, what do you want to talk about um, before things really go bad in this episode? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it had that very idealistic sense to it like you were talking about with the creators of the show pabu was this paradise oasis they developed in the the middle of covid i very much think uh the maker of the disney park should do a star wars water park that's based on pabu i would go there yes (laughs) so you're kind of reminded of all of those joyful parts of it um but even from the very beginning uh the sun is is setting on Pabu in the, the environment. And so I didn't quite catch that on the first go round, but you know, I think it, it very much foreshadows what's about to happen. Symbolic, isn't it? As, mm-hmm. as the sun is setting on their paradise. It's a great, uh, great metaphorical look. We also get to see Liana, the little girl, uh, who was Omega's friend from Sisu, and then Shep, who is the, the tall gentleman who appears to be sort of like the ambassador or the leader, or he's, he's like, um, they call him the mayor. They do call him the mayor. Yeah. He's, he's almost got like, like a little Buddha, uh, pooch belly there. And he's clearly very loving and kind. And then, um, things go bad because this clone trooper takes over. And, and I, I didn't expect him to be as effective as he was, but for me, things get real when Wrecker gets hurt. If Wrecker can be knocked unconscious, and I was afraid he was dead, I Same. thought, "Oh no, you would, you did too," mm-hmm. because of the tech thing, right? Yeah, yeah, very much. When 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 that exploded and he was on the ground, I was like, "Did they just do that? They couldn't do that." It seemed the only thing that made me think he was alive was it seemed a little too unemphasized. <laughs> like like if they're gonna kill another member of the Bad Batch on us, it it, it sh- probably should have had a little bit more gravity to it. But oddly enough, that's almost why I thought it was real because mm-hmm. everything was so cold blooded and, and emotionless that they were, they were trying to make us feel like the people on Pabu did. So I, I was afraid. And I even said, out, Oh no, not a record. Come on, do not do that. And the fact that he was unconscious for as long as it was, I think that has to happen story wise, because if the biggest, toughest guy can be out for the count and you don't know his, his health status, mm-hmm then you don't feel safe. And we've already seen evidence in this series that clones in Clone Force 99 can die. And we don't know what happens if there is a next part to their story after season three, if they even make it through season three. Mason, what do you think when everything was happening and Wrecker was unconscious, maybe even dead? Yeah, um, when he went in the water, I thought, oh no, he's going to drown. But I liked how he saved Gonky before he did anything else. (laughs) That's right. Your memory is really so much better than mine. <laughs> it's true. Uh, Batcher ends up being, I, th- I, th- I was afraid that Batcher was going to be someone that was going to be um, a little creature, like a little puppy dog or something that we were going to have to worry about. But Batcher could very much take care of himself. And then we see the thing that is the most fearsome Republic gunships. The Empire shows up. They start tearing things apart, marching in. Uh, what did either of you notice about this sequence of the invasion? It was very um, 
kind of careless. They have that shot of the boots of the troopers coming in and they're just not even bothering to step over things. Um, even stuff that's going to get their boots all dirty. They just keep going, walking through it. And it was very, again, orderly and very careless, uh, especially in contrast to Pabu, which is an island that has so much life and joy. It was very harsh. Harsh is, a, there's a massive dichotomy and very much a split. Mason, what about you? Yeah, it's just when they were invading, um, they all worked in groups in like basically a circle when they took people out of their home, worried that something or someone was going to fight back. Mm-hmm. And and then there's that scene where uh, Clone Trooper X is just marching in a straight line as all of these panicked citizens of Pabu are running opposite him, but he doesn't even seem to stop or slow down or seem to be the slightest bit concerned that like some sort of an ant- antelope, you know, why am I having a hard time with words? Uh, stampede. There we go. <laughs> stampede. <laughs> me, me have way with words. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for listening to Coffee with Kenobi for almost 11 years. Uh, they show up and blow up the boats. All the ships are destroyed. Uh, Omega is starting to sense that something really, really bad is happening. Um, and then we get to see everyone panicking and running off. There was something else I was going to point out that I think is also important. And the fact that now, as you said earlier, Father Jimmy, now it's even darker, right? Mm-hmm. Now now it's even darker. Um, and then we've then also to make it decides she is going to surrender mason what do you think about the plan and sort of how that happened on on the at the end of the episode yeah um well i if i was omega what i would have done since they only searched her for one tracking device i would have had that that track in my pocket but also put another one in my sock oh (laughs) that's a good idea because since they only searched her once so right uh father jimmy yeah i thought um I thought it was a, a very big moment for her character and for sort of the Bad Batch as well. One of the parts that I realized of earlier in the episode that we we skipped was her deciding to put Tex goggles and mm. oh yeah and the the Tuca doll in the kind of museum shrine. And to me, that like I don't know if it was intentional, but it seemed a little bit of foreshadowing that she puts those goggles there from tech and he decides to execute i think it was plan 99 at the end of last season which was him sacrificing himself and then here is omega Mm. stepping up and not in a mortal sense but sacrificing herself for everyone else that's a good point and that that is a key moment because it's very symbolic it's it's her actual tuka doll that has been very sacred for her for this entire series and then tech's goggles which you know, besides a, um, a couple of nods maybe in the, first, in the second episode, they haven't talked about Tech or brought him up at all. Why do you think that is? I don't know. For me, the the main thing, the impact it had was her giving over those, gla- those goggles, like hit really hard mm-hmm. because you're kind of like, oh, that's right. We went through this last season, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we went through that, that emotional roller coaster last season and it was that kind of it gave so much extra weight to the episode reminding ourselves of what we went through at the end of last season and i would say i'm glad that they haven't because if they just are constantly bringing it up and being sad then they're not moving forward and honoring his sacrifice Mm -hmm. so the fact there's a nice acknowledgement there uh these things mean everything to me but this is like a museum uh, and there, there's something very sacred and beautiful about that. Omega continues to show that she is the hero of heroes and she is continually willing to sacrifice for the greater good because if not, that whole place is going to be destroyed. And, and who knows, maybe it's still going to be. Uh, mm-hmm. But Omega has good intentions. Mason, what about you? Yeah, um, when she gave up Tex Goggle, I was like, wow, I'm surprised she's doing that. But when she gave up the Tuka doll, I was like, no. <laughs> I agree. That almost hit me more because she had such a, it was like, it was like her, ident- it was like her 
It was like her last semblance of reminding us that she is a child. And maybe, and this is the moment where she stops being a kid completely. You know, maybe this is where she's like, I'm, I mean, letting go of childish things. I mean, which is scriptural, by the way, obviously. Um, So that's pretty powerful, pretty symbolic. As they leave, uh, at the very very end, Omega does turn herself away. And then Crosshair gets a chance to shine, to save the day. Mason, what happens? Yeah, he um, is about to shoot when the ship is about to take off to shoot the tracking device on the ship. But a bunch of troopers find him and start shooting him, so he has to deal with them. And then while he's sprinting, he tries to shoot it, but the ship just went super fast and took off, and so it went into the water. And I gasped out loud when that happened. So because he gets a chance to be the hero. And even with his skill, because his hand didn't appear to like act up. And it's just that it, it just said the timing was bad. It was not meant to be then. And it just, again, she's lost. But then she does something at the end that gave me a little bit of hope. The way she was just centering herself and breathing. Uh, Mason, you're shaking your head. What do you think of there? Like like you gasped out loud when he missed the shot. I literally gasped out loud so loud when she did that. I was like, she's going to use the force to get out of this somehow. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people uh, had similar uh, indications of that uh, as well. Father Jimmy, what about you? Yeah, for me, Crosshair missing that shot was one of the things that pushed me to put heartbreaking Mm-hmm. for for this because like you mentioned it's not that he missed because his hand was shaky it was just unfortunate circumstances and partially heartbreaking for crosshair he's filmed formed this deeper bond with omega and now he's kind of knows she's uh, waiting on him she's expecting him to help and he just missed the shot and that's sort of what his skill is um yeah Yeah, and it was very um, hopeful the way that last kind of shot of Omega, um, especially with the previous episode, knowing what she might be going into, knowing that Dr. Carr is hopefully going to be on her side. Um, And that had even just thinking about the Tuca doll again. Yes. You know, the, the first episode was ended with a, handmade Tuka doll in Eva's cell. Mm. And now then Omega gets rid of her actual Tuka doll. And now she's going back and hopefully this will at least form some connection between them. I, I doubt they would put Omega with those other children knowing that she's already escaped once. Uh, but, but who knows? Right. Well, it's going to be fun to see. Uh, and um, I don't know that I'll be able to wait another week because <laughs> these, these have been really powerful. Very, very powerful. And then just like at the end of the last one, the end of this one, there's an even more long deliberate pause. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, ah, oh, because now she's captured again. If it wasn't for the buildup of season in season three and how hard it is to find Tantus, what in the world now? It's it's there are so many more questions and answers, but boy oh boy, was this suspenseful and effective. So I guess we should give our letter grades and any last minute thoughts that we have. Mason, what about you? Tell me your letter grade and any last one things you'd like to say about this episode. Yeah, I think I normally want to do this, but I think this is an A plus because like the last one, how important this is to the story and how much they can have to add on to this and what they can do with this moving forward. Hey, I think that is very, very valid. Uh, and well, I'll say my comments, Father Jimmy. What about you? Um, I'm I'm gonna flip. I'll go a minus on this one. Um, it was very good. It was, it was again one of my my favorite episodes. But a, a lot of it does seem to set the stage for the final act of this season. So it, part of it was a little bit of a transition, which is needed. You can't just cold jump from one step to the next, but. Um, yeah, especially in comparison, like I personally thought the um, I can't remember what the previous episode was called, Identity Crisis. Yes, yes. that one, um, that one I thought was was excellent. 
All right. Well, I am uh, going to be on uh, teams there for this one. I'm going to say this one's an A plus two. <laughs> Because while it is a, certainly a transitional thing, it didn't feel like that. The weight of it was so heavy. The emotion that it it arose in me when I saw what the Empire was doing and how they were treating the people of Pabu. Omega's fierce love and loyalty for the people, not just her brothers, but for everyone there. And the fact at the end that she gives an exhale Whatever it might mean, at its heart, what it does mean is that she is calming herself in an unfair, toxic, challenging, dangerous situation. And she handles it with a plum and grace and a dignity that most of the population would not be able to do. And because of that and the intense emotions that it made me feel all over the spectrum, and we got to see ice cones, it's an A+. It's definitely an A+. Plus. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> well, thank you both so much for breaking down these two episodes, Identity Crisis and Point of No Return. Father Jimmy, always a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, please let everybody know where they can reach out if they'd like to talk Star Wars with you or just say hello. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mason. This was a true joy, a true honor to discuss this with both of you. Uh, I can be found on Twitter or X, whatever it officially goes by. Uh, FR Father Jimmy underscore Morgan. That's where you can find me. Uh, mostly Star Wars and Jesus. That's what I tweet about or hey, retweet. <laughs> yes, sounds good to me. And Mason, um, I'll let you share where, where people can find you. On the basketball court. Is, there, is it always the same one? Can we, like, if we want to play against you, we have to go to the exact same court? I mean, it depends. Depends on where you're at. That was ominous and exciting. All right, very, very good. Well, thank you both so much. And we're definitely looking forward to seeing what's coming next on Star Wars The Bad Batch. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for.